four years down the road, maybe a hundred people can do it. And then eight years down the road, maybe a thousand people can do it. And that's how you level up the playing field more and more and more. I don't know when that got lost. Yo, do you know a CrossFit historian? Has anybody called themselves a CrossFit historian? I don't know, maybe like a Brian Friend could be considered a CrossFit historian. I would like to throw my hat into the ring and be one of the CrossFit historians. And I'm gonna try to get a little bit of clout here and I'm gonna go into the journal. The journal is the main source of history here. And I know a lot of people have read these and I know that probably a lot of people know more about them, but they're not talking about them on the internet like I'm about to talk about it on the internet. I like to do this because in the present day where everything is kind of all you kind of forget where we came from. You forget about what CrossFit is. I also really like this one because I've always thought that it holds true present day. And that was something that Greg Glassman would always do is he would say some stuff and sometimes it'd be a little bit off kilter, but then you look back now 20 years at this point to the time in which this article was written and you go, wow, that was pretty good. Back then it looked a little bit crazy, but present day it looks pretty freaking good. So this article is titled, How Fit Are You? April of 2003 on issue eight of the CrossFit Journal. In this, Greg Glassman throws out a test that will give you the fittest person on earth. It's five tests. You do one on day one, second one on day two, third one on day three. And I've always thought that this would be very cool to have done at the CrossFit Games. Logistically, I don't know how much sense it makes because it does cover all the bases in the five tests. As far as the movement patterns go, I think it could do a little bit better over the course of how long and how short things are. There isn't anything very long in this test, but it covers the movement patterns and it has a very cool scoring table. We'll go over that at the end. I do want to talk about a couple of things in here. So there is a particular spot in the prelude to the actual workouts where he's talking about what's going on here, the idea behind it. And one of those things is he says, in the end, we decided that improving these neurological skills and thereby encouraging a greater level of fitness in our participants was more important than offering a test that was universally inclusive. When I hear that, it rings really true with the present day happenings that if you can't do something, you shouldn't be doing it. And if you can't do it, you either need to work yourself into a position where you can uphold the movement standards or you can't do it. And he says it right here in 2003, encouraging a greater level of fitness is more important than being universally inclusive. Now, yes, everybody needs to work out and everybody should have something to work towards. And that is what he goes into when he continues on this paragraph. The continuing of the paragraph goes, we are ultimately a program test of elite fitness and any test of elite fitness will contain elements that cannot be performed by everyone. We also felt that many of our best athletes, while among the fittest people on earth, needed an additional motivation for improvements in absolute strength, relative strength, and gymnastics foundations. So he's talking about everybody here. He's talking about the elite people. The elite people need a carrot to reach for. That goes for the average everyday person. It goes for the person who's doing their first workout ever. There's always something that you need to be working for. So if you just walked into a gym, maybe your thing is you're trying to work out every day or you're trying to get into the gym a certain number of times a week. And then once you hit that goal, maybe your next goal is you're trying to make sure you're squatting below parallel. You're trying to get into a good overhead squat position so you can do snatches with everybody. And then once you can snatch, and let's say you're snatching 300 pounds, there has to be a goal for those elite people. And that's something that I think is very missed present day. There was a time where the muscle up was something that a lot of people couldn't do. My rings are up here. There was a time where if you could do a muscle up as a female, you were almost a shoe in to be a regional athlete. That was like 2013, 2014. Present day, it's very, very rare that you'll see a female in the top 10% of the quarterfinals who is unable to do a muscle up. I know people are gonna say, oh, there were people at the Granite Games who couldn't do muscle ups. Eh. True, but generally there are way, way more people who can do muscle ups, especially on the male side. Like almost every male can do it one muscle up. But even back 10 years ago, there are a bunch of people who couldn't. Where is the carrot? Like where are people going at this time? Why is it having to be more and more inclusive? Part of the thing that was so cool about this is there was always an ever arching thing we were going for. Everyone saw the pegboard in 2016, I believe it was. No woman in the field was able to complete this event, but Margot Alvarez will get the closest and she will earn 100 points as the rest. Where people were just sitting there staring at the pegboard. They couldn't do it. And then you fast forward three years.
three years and they're doing unbroken pegboard climbs up and down and up and down. And that is where CrossFit came from. He says it right here in 2003. At a certain point in time, you have to level up the difficulty of stuff. And over here on my board, I have a workout. I have a workout that I wrote that very much holds true to this. Somebody came in my garage the other day, was looking at that workout and goes, that's too hard. No one's going to be able to do it. And I go, that's the fucking point. Like no one should be able to do it. If one or two people can do it right now and everyone's like, oh, that's cool. My goal, I want to be able to do that. And if you can't do it, you scale. There will be one person in the world can do it and everybody will scale. Four years down the road, maybe a hundred people can do it. And then eight years down the road, maybe a thousand people can do it. And that's how you level up the playing field more and more and more. I don't know when that got lost. When did that get lost? So we have this article and it's just titled, How Fit Are You? And what it is, is it's five tests. The first test, bench press followed by a max set of pull-ups. Yeah, how does that work? There's a scoring table. There's a scoring table at the end where it say, hey, test one, test two, three, four, and five. Perfect score is 100 points, 100 points. You multiply the pounds that you bench press by the number of pull-ups that you get. When you look at the table and it says 400 pound bench times 40 pull-ups, it gives you a score of 16,000. 16,000 gives you 20 points. You're done on test number one. If you were to do something like a 300 pound bench and 50 pull-ups, you would get a score of 15,000. And 15,000 gives you a number at the end of 16 points. And that's your score on test number one. Very cool, very easy to figure out. And it will give you somebody who's big and strong something to do and somebody who's light, maybe not as strong on the bench press, something to kind of balance that out. Back in 2003, something that Greg said in the prelude to this again was that all the heavy guys want to throw weights around, deadlift, bench press, and throw, and the small guys want to run, jump, and do pull-ups. And when you're doing a complete test for everybody, you got to think about that guy, you got to think about that guy, and then the perfect and most fit person will be able to do both better than either of them, or at least as close to them as possible. You see that in the first test? Very much so. The second test, 15 rep max clean and jerk. Have you ever done a 15 rep max clean and jerk? Who's done the workout? Gwen. I have. Gwen is 15, 12, 9. Four to load, one weight, you gotta do them unbroken. So let's say, hey, you put 135 on a barbell, clean and jerks, unbroken. The bar can't rest on the floor. It can rest in the front rack, it can rest overhead. You gotta do 15 in a row, then you gotta do 12 in a row, then you gotta do nine in a row. Then that's your score. You say, oh, that's easy. When I usually do it, I put them on the zero, on the five, and on the 10. So you gotta start your set of 12 at five and your set of nine at 10. It just makes it a little bit more repeatable. I like to do that. That's not necessary per the workout, Gwen. But what is important is that that set of 15 completely devastates you for the set of 12. You have no idea what's going on. My heaviest Gwen is 205. And I remember I was doing it in the garage. It was right here and I was like wandering around. I didn't know where I was. And then when I did the set of 12, I almost completely died. And I don't know how I got through the set of nine. But the idea is that this, he says it right here in character, this classic movement is traditionally an excellent test of overall strength. But when performed for 15 reps, becomes an extraordinary metabolic challenge as evidenced by a max heart rate and respiratory rate. How is this something that is just that clear as day in 2003 and then something that we completely forget about present day. Scroll down to the table. You'll see that male 205 for me, that would have given me 16 points on this test. I would also see that if I wanted a perfect score, I'd have to get 225 or more. There would probably be a lot of people in the CrossFit games just slapping 225 on and trying to do 15 unbroken reps. If you fail, then you get a zero. And that's pretty cool too. You're rolling the dice. Can I do it? I don't know. How many people have done a max unbroken set of clean jerks? I'm sure some people can do that for sure. Especially 20 years after this article is written. But that's still very cool. Great test. Test number three, Tabata squat followed by four minutes of muscle ups. Tabata squat, 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off. You do it for eight rounds. When you do a Tabata scoring format, you take the lowest number of squats you did over the course of those eight rounds. If I do seven rounds where I get 10 squats and on the eighth round I get nine, my score is nine. Then you do an AMRAP of muscle ups in four minutes. So it's not an unbroken set. You, if you want to do singles, you can do singles. If you want to do sets of 10, you can do sets of 10. For their example down there, they have for a perfect score, 22 on the Tabata squats. That's a very tough number of Tabata squats. It means that over the course of your eight rounds of 20 seconds on and 10 seconds off, in your 20 seconds, your worst number of air squats was 22. If you would have gotten 21, your score would have been 21. You multiply that by the number of muscle ups in four minutes, which was 30, you get a score of 660 and that's perfect. I'd venture to say that this number of muscle ups would completely skew this present day and that's okay. It's 20 years later, mind you. But still, the idea of doing the Tabata, grassroots CrossFit type of workout along with the muscle up is very cool to give you this score. And it's also coming off of the back of the weightlifting only movement. Here is a body weight only movement. A body weight only event. Body weight only test. Next, you've got a one rep max deadlift followed by a max set of handstand push-ups. Very much looks like that first test 
bench, which was the bench press and the pull-ups. There is a caveat to this though, is that the handstand push-ups must bring the ears below the hands, so they have to be done on parallel bars, parallettes, or some other raised platform, like chairs or books. And present day, you'd probably just think, okay, we're gonna use plates. So you gotta bring your hands below your ears on the plates, so what does that end up being? Like a five or six inch deficit? Five, inch, five or six inch deficit handstand push-up after your one rep max deadlift, go down, look at the chart. And I know that these are all in male numbers, but we can all always figure that out per the 68, 69% age number that we can use these for females on the list, but a 600 pound deadlift followed by 25 handstand push-ups would give you a perfect score for the males. And for the females, that would end up being like a 435, 445 pound deadlift. Final test is an 800 meter run with 21 reps at 75 pounds on the thruster and 21 L pull-ups. Here is your core component. And everyone thinks, it's like, oh, where's the GHC setups? Where's the toes to bar? It's like, have you ever done an L setup, like a real L setup where your legs are straight? Like not the freaking limp legged, bent knee freaking an L sit up, L pull, L, L sit hold, but a real L where you're trying to keep your heels with a straight leg above your hips when you're trying to also do pull ups. It completely changes the pull up. It can cha changes the movement arm of your body when you're doing a pull up. And I would venture to say that not many people will have an easy time doing those 21 L pull ups, especially after a high effort 800 meter run and after the 75 thrusters, which is very easy present day, but who knows? Maybe nobody knows how to lock their elbows out the way that Greg Glassman had intended in 2003. But there is a time there, do this under four minutes, and that's a perfect score. That's freaking fast. So figure mile time of six, that means that half of that for the 800 is three minutes, and you've got to do then the 21 thrusters and the 21 L pull-ups in under a minute. I don't know anybody who's doing that. So a lot of people will be trying for that perfect score if they did this at the CrossFit Games, and then a lot of people are going to end up in that 401 to 430 round where they're getting those 16 points. And that's probably because they're going to get no rep on the L pull-ups where they aren't keeping their heels above their hips. Heels dip below the hips, no rep. Oh yeah, and those pull-ups are also strict. So this is before a lot of people have any idea what was going on at CrossFit. I bet a lot of you guys who are watching this YouTube video right now have never even known of the CrossFit Journal. And that's sad because the CrossFit Journal had a lot of good stuff in it. Of course, I am a little bit into the game side of thing, into the elite fitness side of things. And I find things like this and I always like to reflect on things like this and I can draw parallels on things like this into the present day. And we talked about the, if you can't do it, you shouldn't be allowed into the freaking realm of elite fitness and if you can't do it, work towards it. Don't make exceptions for people who can't do it. Force the people to do it. And then of course, the big one that I said, which is that they're coming out with benchmarks. You look at the new benchmark workouts and every single person can do them. That is not where we came from. Right all the new girl workout where it was 10 rounds of three bar facing burpees and three clean and jerks at 135, 95. And that workout was just all transitions. I thought it was freaking stupid. The only one that I actually liked was Andy, which was the hundreds. And it was a very light bar, 65, 45. But other than that, there was never a workout that came out there that was really unachievable. So they came out with the new girls. It's like, oh, look at the new girls. And they were all just workouts that everyone could do with the exception of maybe the one of the 55 muscle ups that are in there. But still, I remember a time where they would come out work with workouts like King Kong. And who remembers King Kong? One, go. Yeah. Uneven. Yeah. It was three rounds of a deadlift at 455, 320 for the females, and then it was two muscle ups and three squat cleans at 250, 175 for the females, and then four handstand push ups. It became a workout where it was very cool for people to be able to do the, do the workout in general. And there really aren't many workouts like that anymore. Everyone can do everything all the time because I don't know why. Like, well, do you not? This is why history is important. You want to learn from history. You want to get better because of it. Everyone liked that. Everyone liked to work towards stuff. That's probably the main point that I want to bring up today is remember that things don't need to be doable by everyone all the time or you water down what it is that was so cool about us in the first place. If you like this one, let me know. Comment about it. Andrew Hiller out.